thank you so much for having us. We're very delighted to be a part of this conference and to be able to give a talk on our introductory discussion on functional juniors leveling up, leveling up your new Elixir devs. Uh, he, great, he gave a great description of who we are, but we'll just talk about it one more time. So I'm Savannah, this is Gabe, and we're full stack software engineers currently working at Iconic Moments, where we're building an NFT marketplace for museums, and we use predominantly Elixir. I'm Savannah, I am self-taught. I graduated from university, but with an entirely unrelated degree. I started a rock climbing company in 2017, which was a ton of fun until COVID hit. And I realized I needed to switch what I was doing. I was also getting a little bored with what I was doing in the climbing industry and started picking up uh, programming and started self-teaching. Uh, and then I got hired by the company I currently work with because I was interested in Elixir and now I absolutely love it. Hello everybody, my name is Gabriel and I went the traditional route of picking up computer science through computer engineering and computer science background and I learned, learned through that through college and after college I started a subscription tracking software after graduation and then went on to work in the company that me and, me and Savannah met at and I've only started learning about picking up Elixir for the past year so far. So the purpose of this talk is mostly targeted towards junior engineers who are picking up the language and are trying to learn how to work in Elixir, especially coming from an object-oriented programming kind of background. So for many of us, I would assume many, many of us are seniors. At some point, we were mostly self-taught. Like Elixir is a language that we pick up, uh, maybe not, it's not our first language, and for many junior engineers, it probably isn't the first one they interact with. So this, is kind of, this talk is to help to encourage junior engineers to pick up the language and the new things, the new facets they can see about the language, and also the use cases that Elixir has that make it easy to use, especially for more complex tasks. So we have a second purpose, uh, increased interest in Elixir development. Um, Elixir devs are very passionate about Elixir, uh, which is why I particularly love uh, writing in Elixir and being a part of the community. Um, and for many people, yeah, Elixir isn't their first language, but when they do adopt it, there's a lot of praise. So in this talk, we want to demonstrate a project that shows our culmination of our past year's worth of working with Elixir, and we hope after the talk, senior devs will consider taking juniors under their wings to help foster and widen this community as the language grows. Why do we think Elixir is a great language for junior devs to adopt? There are tons of reasons. One of the biggest ones is rise, rising popularity. There's a Stack Overflow um, developer survey that we found that shows uh, Phoenix is very widely loved by those who use it. Thank you, Chris McCord. Um, so if that, that should be one of your biggest reasons to adopt Elixir. Um, but there are many other reasons, like Elixir has a simple and easy to learn syntax. So just a really short example. Um, in this example, we define a module called my module with a function called my function. It takes two arguments and in inside the function, we add the two arguments together, multiply the result, and uh, it returns. Uh, we then use the IOPuts function to output the result of the calling my module. So as you can see, Elixir code is very readable and easy to understand, easy, even for beginners. Elixir follows the functional programming paradigm. One of the key principles of functional programming is the use of pure functions, which have no side effects and always return the same results for the same input. As you can see, the add numbers function in Elixir is a pure function. It takes two arguments and always returns the same result for those arguments without modifying any external state. This makes it easier to reason about and test our code and helps to avoid bugs that can arise from unexpected side effects. Elixir supports concurrency and distributed computing. It enables developers to create highly concurrent distributed applications. Its support for concurrency allows multiple tasks to be executed simultaneously, while its distributed computing capabilities enable applications to be deployed across multiple machines or nodes. This makes Elixir a powerful choice for building scalable and resilient applications. And of course, it's, a very easy, it's very easy to extend this language and contribute, and the community is very welcoming with lots of opportunities to meet up all over the world. And one of our favorite parts is when it comes to Elixir, there's a number of built-in tools and libraries that make it powerful and flexible. And Gabe will talk about those a little bit. 
And then, so we all know a number of these tools. And we wanted to highlight the main ones that we find very useful, especially with junior engineers. And for one of them is Mix. Mix is a tool that helps us you, helps you scaffold the entire project with just one simple command. Now we found this to be very useful in, gener in just working with it in simple tasks, like managing dependencies, etc. Then XUnit. Now this is something, especially coming from junior engineers, who very much like to avoid testing. Now, this is one thing that we found that was actually very useful to do, and XUnit provides useful defaults to work with test in a testing environment. And IEX, IEX is also a very, very cool tool that we use just to interact with the project. Now, one thing I found interesting about IEX is how you can just build the entire project and then work with the project within the, within the, the interactive shell itself. And then we're working on the, we're basically standing on the shoulder of giants. Erlang OTP has been there for many years and has been battle tested on managing multiple production environments. So why, we, why, why should we not use it? And then we have Phoenix. Phoenix is, it's constantly improving and we love the features that are being added to it constantly. And we see it as a, as a next gen framework. Like we saw in the developer survey, 83% of people love it. So we have, we're work, basically we're working with people who love the language and are willing to build, up, build it up every single step of the way. And then Ecto. Ecto, again, you know, a wrapper that we use to work with, with different databases. Um, it provides useful defaults again and it's, Ecto is amazing. <laughs> However, we found something startling on the same developer survey in 2022. We found that despite this popularity, despite the love that Alexa Phoenix, Alexa Phoenix has, it still ranks very low on the, on the ranking, 30th out of 42. Now, this does not mean that just because a language ranks low, that it doesn't have its place. We all know that these different languages have, have, have different um, points of being used. And all this means is that we have a great love for Phoenix, 83%. It's ranked low. We have a, we, basically, we, we can capitalize on this difference, bring these people into the crowd. Okay. Um, cool. So now that we've kind of given you some foundations, which I'm sure everyone in this room already knew, uh, we're going to talk about something a little more fun. Uh, we built a project. I really like uh, this quote by John Carmack because when we were writing this talk, we initially were discussing only abstractions and we're kind of bored with our progress. So we took a note from Mr. Carmack and we built something. It's called SB. Uh, since we work with an organization that works on the Ethereum blockchain, we found it easy to combine Elixir and blockchain technology to create this tracker tool. So. SP is a real-time NFT tracker. The user provides a contract address and a token ID they want to track, and then SP returns the movement of the NFT from one address to the next. If you're familiar with OpenSea, then it looks, you'll notice it looks very similar to their item activity section. Um, we added a few additional features. Specifically, what EPSI does is it uses the information given to make remote procedural calls to the Ethereum blockchain. It pulls the blockchain every five seconds for a block count update and checks to see if the requested address exists in its transaction history. If it does, then it looks for the token ID and transfer method. A quick diagram of what's going on. We have two main parts, our worker and our business context. So in our worker, we manually set a start block for the, tractor, uh, for the tracker to begin pulling transactions from. And then the worker iterates through the blocks until it's caught up with the most recent one. So here's a screenshot of our initial UI. Our UI is very simple. We're mostly back in devs, so don't <laughs> judge it. Um, you just input the address that you want to track, the token ID, click submit, and then you get this beautiful tracker page that displays your NFT, shows the contract address, the token ID, and then it shows all of the correlated um, method uh, transactions that have happened with this NFT. We also have an additional feature that we're not gonna show the UI for, um, but you, we can track real-time NFT uh, transactions. So if someone buys the NFT in real time, then you'll get a notification. Gabe will talk about this a little bit later. Here's our application in action. Ignore my warnings. I added this in like an hour before the talk. But we start the worker and it starts pulling the block, or it starts uh, requesting data from the blockchain and currently it's searching for the token ID that we passed in. When it gets a hit, it'll output 
the, well, it's outputting the result here, but it saves it to the database and then continues until it reaches up to our current block. So essentially we have a start block and then you have the current block, like the most recent block in the blockchain, and it just continues to iterate through these blocks until it reaches the head and then every five seconds it checks the blockchain to see if there's a new block. Why do we choose to make this? Because it exercises the aforementioned wonder tools of Elixir. So we'll talk about how we implemented some of these tools. We'll start with Ecto. We created three tables. We actually created like seven tables because we weren't sure what we wanted to make initially because we planned really oddly. But the result is three tables. The first one is a NFT table. So this just stores our results. Uh, it stores our results as a token ID, an address, a to, from, and a timestamp. A contract table, so in the input, uh, whenever you add the address and the token ID, it gets stored in this table. And our filters table, uh, this is going to be talked about a little bit later. Next, our worker. All right, so a key part of the worker is that it pulls the blockchain every single five seconds. Now, you could change the interval if you want to, but the point is we want to see how, want to basically be updated with the latest block. Now, a block could have hundreds to thousands of transactions, but basically you want to keep updating, make, to basically keep it more real time. Now, here we see the setup of our gen server, where we basically want to see if we set a flag to pull the blockchain, then it does so. And it does it every five seconds and then calls itself. Now, again, the worker passes these messages and maintains the state. So if we, for example, want to be updated with the latest block, every single time it pulls the block blockchain, we update the state with the latest block. And then we have handle continue. Now, we don't want to set up the entire state within the init, the init function. So we want to also offload the rest of this setup into handle continue. Now, what we do here is we specify a start block now, blocks are continuous, contiguous on the blockchain. Now, what you want to do is, this, is, this could be arbitrary. So it could be as has, however far as you want. So we set, we set a sp specific one in a history we, we thought was more conducive. And from that, we, again, maintain the state and keep on going. We do this because we don't have an archive node. So if you're familiar with the blockchain, you would need a, a full copy of the blockchain. And we don't. So we just reiterate through it, um, through inferior, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And then we have handle info. So this is where we, whenever we call ourselves back, we can handle the information account, we can handle the call, and then update the, the block, the latest block. And then from here, we actually do the processing of the blocks, and then we, through the blocks, we iterate through it, and then look for spe the specific tr transactions that we want. Now, gateless block. This is where we start using the client libraries for interacting with the blockchain. Now, Ethereum X is a specific library that helps us to talk to, to the specifically Ethereum. Now, here they provide a, con a function that helps us get the latest block currently on the blockchain. Now, here a little primer on blockchains for those not familiar. Now, the blockchain is basically in the history of it is to help to increase trust and security by producing a ledger that's unmodified, it continues forever and it's transparent. All the transactions on it can be seen and if you want to just see what happened at a particular point in time, it provides that information. So in that sense, it provides trust and security by helping you transact in all kinds of ways with it. And each block consists of a number of transactions, it could be 100 to 1,000, and there are different methods for this, but Ethereum uses a proof of stake kind of consensus mechanism, which is better because it reduces if it increases efficiency and it reduces the agency, energy expenditure. And we, specifically Ethereum, has a way for you to run code on it. Now this is how we're able to interact with the blockchain. It uses, it uses the EVM, which stands for the Ethereum Virtual Machine. So you can actually host contracts, which are, which are a bunch of code which runs on the blockchain and we can actually call it and run functions on it. And uh, they expose a JSON RPC method for us to work with it. Now, what we use is specifically, this could be one amongst many, but Infura is an infrastructure as a service, and they basically provide APIs for you to call the blockchain and get back results. We promise we love Elixir more than the blockchain. <laughs> so on to our business logic. Uh, this was really fun for us. So our business logic handled how our transactions kind of uh, flow through our data pipeline. The entry point was our uh, parse blocks uh, function. It keeps up and returns the state after it's been passed down the data pipeline. 
We take two paths if, depending on our flag set. So we set a flag in our config file that essentially said whether or not we wanted to take the filter path state, which Gabe will talk about just in a little bit, but I'll talk about the transaction path. Our two paths relate to our tables. Our transaction path pulls historical transactions from the blockchain while our filter path searches for pending transactions and notifies us in real time when an NFT has moved. So we need the transaction path to have the historical data. And like I mentioned before, we have to rewind every time because we don't have an archive node. So the beginning of our transaction path, so this is the first part of our data pipeline, uh, is our transaction path. We get a block, the function get block is shown below, and uh, we pass it a number, it makes a call to our um, RPC provider and it returns the block number. It checks to see if any addresses from our contract schema exist in the transactions in our current block. Um, so I'm just showing a few really poorly made tests right now, so I'm not showing like all of our implementation. Um, but it filters transactions by address. It takes a log and it essentially looks up the address that you added into the input that we stored in our contracts DB. And if it finds it, then it returns that map. It then goes into get transaction receipts. So it takes a list of transactions, performs the RPC call on each transaction, returns a list of maps. We have to keep modifying the data as we go through because the RPC gives us like a little bit of data that we then need for like our next call. So in this example, we, we needed the receipt out of this specifically to get um, part of the logs that contain the token ID and the to and the from addresses. Uh, our next function takes a list of receipt transactions and, and it continues to pass it down the data pipeline. So in our transactions module, this is where a lot of the um, decoding happens for our logs. Uh, yeah, our data pipeline does the following. It decodes a single incoming transaction and filters to see if it matches the events we are looking for, which is transfer. Uh, we used xkcac hash to match the transfer address. So when the address was found within, uh, when the transfer method was found within our map, we again filtered through those, and then we filtered through another part of the topics to find the to, the from, and the token ID. Couple limitations with this method is the cost. So it uses up a large amount of API request and in-memory storage. Fortunately for us, uh, Infura gives, it, gives you 100,000 requests a day. So as long as we didn't work on our project for more than like two hours, it was fine. Uh, long data pipeline, more, pro more error prone. I spent probably an hour trying to figure out where one of my modules were that was named SBNFT and it was capitalized in one area and not in another, but because my pipeline was so long, I got very confused and wasted a lot of time on a capitalization error. So yeah, the limitation was definitely just working through such a long pipeline. Uh, fixes, it gathers historical data accurately. It can be built on easily to add more to the pipeline or extract different data. We get tons of data back, so it's easy to just add whatever additional features we want to with the, with the data we're keeping. All right, one thing to mention at Gotcha is that one way as junior engineers that we fall into these traps or fall into these kind of errors is we don't test. So we did, what we didn't show is actually added tests to catch those kind of use, um, edge cases. Now this is a different path that we use that is, works to reduce the cost to the blockchain. Now it's again, as junior engineers, we don't try, we only, we avoid looking at documentation and we're trying to see if our code can work. Now this is one method where we actually had to dig through the doc documentation and see what kind of other methods do they have. Now, if the filter path is a way, basically, instead of having to post to the blockchains, we create a filter that is specific on the particular addresses that we want. And what it does is, instead of having, going again through hundreds of thousands, it tells us, hey, this particular address has a particular change, a state status change on the blockchain for it. And then we have a, again, you have a schema. And the benefit of this is it provides for you a from block. Basically, it tells us we only want to see changes from this particular block onwards. Now, we could specify a from and to, but the benefit of having a from block is that we don't, we, we, it gives us all the updates up to, up to the latest block. And then it belongs to a particular contract because you only want to watch the changes for one particular contract. Now, why we need the filter ID is because Infura gives you a particular filter which lives on the Infura, on the Infura infrastructure. 
And then here, if you want a new filter, it gives you, we call um, a, new, a new filter, which gives you back an ID, and that ID basically lives in the Ethereum blockchain. And then whenever we want to see changes on that particular ID, we just call it back and with, the, with the same ID, and then hope that we get back results. And a filter stays open for like 15 minutes? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now the limitation of this is that we have no way to view what's happening on the Infura blockchain. What they say they do is that they create a, a virtual in-memory replica of the, entire, of, the, of the entire Ethereum node, and that way we can, be able, we can be able to query for it. And then they say that they have a particular, pos when you, whenever you make a new filter, that filter latches itself on a particular point on the on their in-memory uh, replica, and then they have a microservice architecture which helps them to query it every single time. Now the problem with this is it's prone to errors. We don't know if something fails, and if sometimes you've got duplicate results. Now the fix for this is to reduce the number of times you can pull the blockchain. Now again, this is something we did. We went through through try and error process. As junior engineers, we're like, hey, what's going on? So we just, we reduce the calls from multiple every single second, sometimes millisecond calls into five second calls, and we got better results. And then to update the uh, Another thing, like we mentioned, is that we don't know when a filter crashes, because we don't have a way to view, to view what's happening on the Infura infrastructure. So what we do is we, we pattern match on all the errors, and whenever something happens, we kill the old one, or if it's already dead, we just update the new filter. And then here we have, we create fixtures to test our code and to make sure that everything works. So we make sure that we get a new filter ID, and the new filter ID is present in a database. Okay, a couple of takeaways. We really encourage anyone looking to get into Elixir to find a friend and build something together. Uh, after you learn the foundations, Elixir makes it really easy to plug and play your ideas. Uh, so that was probably one of the biggest like takeaways with this project is that we had fun. And I think every day at work, I have fun. Because I, I really like how Elixir works and it works super well with my brain. Um, I don't know if that's a takeaway. Uh, one of the takeaways was it's easily easy to take different paths to solve problems. I really like the data pipeline because it was easy to extend whatever direction we wanted to go. And since we didn't do a ton of planning for this project, it was uh, conducive, not time saving, but nice to be able to seek out different directions. Uh, reasonable Ecto Phoenix defaults. Uh, Ecto less easy to work with. Phoenix is very easy to work with. Asynchronous programming made easy. Uh, functional pro programming eliminates errors related to mutating data. Testing early and often builds confidence. Some of the challenges faced, um, thinking functionally coming from OOP, so we both come from OOP backgrounds, so in the beginning it, it just takes a little bit to switch over to the functional mindset. And outdated documentation, we're a little behind on that sometimes. Our backgrounds. So, we're, so from our perspectives, we hope that the demonstration of our project encourages you to hire devs of all varieties because Elixir is truly an adoptable, adoptable language that anyone can utilize. Um, hopefully, you've seen that from our project today. Just a little takeaway for seniors. We assume most of you are probably a little higher up in the room, uh, and we encourage you to. Uh, encourage your junior devs to do project-based learning, uh, mentor mentorship, and peer support from other juniors. Uh, it was really nice to have uh, an additional person to learn Elixir with and kind of go through the, the process. And then we have a list of resources. So these are the, some of the resources that we utilize to gain our footing in Elixir. Joy of Elixir was really great for syntax. It's just a, just a great uh, introduction to the language, Elixir programming is a great overview of all the concepts. Pragmatic Studio is a like follow along course. You actually build uh, kind of like a Phoenix uh, entity like from scratch in that one. Uh, programming Phoenix book, of course, and testing Elixir book. And that is all. Thank you for coming. All right, so we have a few time, few minutes for uh, Q&A. Uh, I forgot to mention before this talk actually started, uh, and that's in, for the people that are online uh, watching the stream, we also have a Q&A uh, section in, the, in Whova. So if you have questions, if you're online, you can also post them there. For the people in the room, uh, raise your hand if you have a question. 
Uh, we got already the first one via Hoover, and the question was, um, do you have any tips, or what's the best way to onboard junior to mid-level developers coming from another language? So what are your tips if you're coming from a different language? Um, can you take this one? I can take it. Uh, yeah, so, so personally, my seniors started off by, they, they gave me a lot of space to learn the syntax first. They gave me like a week. <laughs> to learn the syntax. Um, and then I was dragged into a meeting where I had to implement FizzBuzz in Elixir. So that was encouraging because I failed. And that helped me okay. to realize that I needed to get a little better. So I appreciated the, the stepping stones. So it was a bit of that, um, of being able to learn the foundations and the syntax in like a, um, a really nice environment. But then maybe like a, a couple weeks in, I was given an actual task that was um, data pipelines, so transforming data. I was uh, stitching together NFTs. So having a project like that where I'm transforming data, it's not overly complicated, and you kind of use the same things over and over again, it was really nice to help me get used to using Elixir in the language. So that's my best takeaway. Okay. Thank you. Hello, thank you for your talk. Um, a question for me. Um, what did you find coming from another language into Elixir was perhaps a hard thing uh, to learn how to do in Elixir or to find out how to do um, that perhaps you had taken for granted in another language? And how do you think if what such a thing exists, we could improve it? I can take this one. Uh, coming from an OOP basis, especially in college. For example, in college, I, we took a different, we learned C++ and Java. Now, the first time I got introduced to asynchronous programming was my, was my senior year. And that's when we started learning stuff like semaphores, um, mutators, we, uh, we have mutexes, all that kind of different things of the asynchronous programming. And that was pretty hard to learn. We did, it's pretty hard to get really good at it. Now, when, we started coming with, when I started learning Elixir, all those things went out of the window. <laughs> you know, it was just message passing, and then you, and you handed the message, you handed the call. It became, basically, I didn't have to worry about locks and that, those kind of things. So I think what for me especially is asynchronous programming. That's one thing that is really easy to, to adopt in Elixir and is, makes other languages kind of seem a little bit more difficult. And also data mutation. And I think that's one of the, they say that in OOP languages, that's like the, basically the, where many bugs are found in mutating data. Now that again is out the window in Elixir. So I think those are the two main benefits, asynchronous programming and data mutation. No, not non-data mutation in Elixir. <laughs> Any more questions? All the way in the back, of course. <laughs> Uh, yeah, my question is, uh, did you know about Elixir before you started learning? Uh, how, what, what drew you to Elixir? Um, yeah, we, we can probably both answer this one. Um, I knew about it from a friend who attempted to build a project in Elixir but didn't make it very far. I didn't know much about Elixir at the time, but he was super, super excited about the language. And at first I was like, oh yeah, that's cool, whatever. And then I interviewed for this job and I didn't know it was an Elixir. And then the CTO told me it was. And I started looking more into um, just like the syntax and the style. And I was like, oh, I love, I really want to get into functional programming. So this seems like a great language. Because I thought about Haskell for a little bit and realized Elixir is just better for me personally. So yeah, that's where that started. I think for me, this is actually a good point for junior engineers, is to go out to meetups. So I think when I started learning about Elixir, I knew nothing about it. And I, learned, I was just looking around, and I heard about a meetup that was happening in the building where I was working, and it was about Elixir. And so I was like, what is Elixir? Let's go see what's happening. And then basically, as I got introduced, um, we just I started going to a couple of meetups. And I was mostly intrigued by this point, we don't have to mutate data. I was like, why? This must, this must be a memory hog. If you don't mutate data, you're creating objects all the time. This is probably too much data. This must be taking up all the memory. So that kind of got me introduced into Elixir. And then I, that's how I started learning. I started loving it. Mm -hmm. Uh, hello. Uh, first, thank you for for your talk. Um, I have a question. Like, if you, if you, for example, hypothetically, if you have to mentor new new junior developers that comes from OP, what would you recommend for the first beginning? Like, by about like, what you did by mistake and probably not do it to to mentor these junior developers. 
sorry, I missed the last bit of that. You said what was the what you wouldn't do? Is yes, like what you. You learn it by like be mentored by senior developers, and uh, now it's your time to be like the mentor for junior developers. What would you do differently, or I don't know, what you suggest for StarNet? Yeah, so actually there was another. I had a different co-speaker, um, and it was a girl who had recently graduated from university, and I had been working with Elixir a little bit longer than she had, and so I stepped into like a bit of a mentorship role with her. So she was yeah like a month behind me, so I was teaching her syntax while I was learning slightly more advanced stuff. So that was super, super useful for me personally, and I think also useful for her, because she was getting not not the senior perspective, but like closer to her perspective, so it was easy for us to uh, work through problems together, because we could both see where the problem was coming from. And I think seniors oftentimes will, don't, don't realize like, what uh, is difficult for a junior, because they just have so much experience, you know? So that was incredibly beneficial for, uh, her and I in the the beginning months of this, um, but I think in the very beginning it's really nice to give space for each dev to go and leak code out like their problems by themselves, and then come back together and talk with their their partner. I think you need the space to to think through the problems and get familiar, and then that progresses a lot. And then another thing was the um, refactoring, like your naive solution. So whenever you first write something, maybe it's not the best way to write it, and then you refactor. So our seniors helped us with that like quite a lot. We would write something, and then they would be like, oh, it's terrible. I'm just kidding. No. They, they would be like, oh, this is, this is great, but you can make it even better if you just adjust a few things or like, you know, remember, pure functions don't add too much like side effects. Um, so yeah, having that naive refactoring approach was super, super helpful.